Well, good afternoon, and let me extend my welcome uh, to you. Thank you so much for coming to our church. Uh, if you were expecting to uh, see Pastor Mark up here preaching to you from Titus chapter 2, I'm not Pastor Mark. Uh, I, my name is Shannel, like, like we mentioned. I serve as one of the other elders. But both Pastor Mark and Pastor Michael have COVID. Um, and so they are at home quarantining, which means I get to preach to you. Um, and I won't preach to you from Titus. Mark will do that for you, God willing, next week. But instead, I am going to uh, preach from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. So you'd be helped to have your Bible out. So if you have your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. I'm going to pray for us before we look at God's Word together. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the power of the cross. Father, we praise you that you have made a way for sinful men and women to find their sins forgiven through Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray now as we come to your word, we ask that you will give us eyes to see Jesus, to love Jesus. Father, I pray that our lives would be transformed because of the work of Christ. We pray this for the sake of your glory. Amen. For those of us that have lived in this country for a while, uh, I don't know about you, but oftentimes, some of us experience something of an identity crisis. So at one level, we all represent different countries, but the one thing that we all have in common is when you flip through the pages of your passport, you'll notice that you'll have this one sticker on your passport that talks about how you have a residence permit to this country to the United Arab Emirates. And every so often, you will have to renew your visa. There have been many times when I've uh, struck up conversations with people that don't live in the UAE, and they'd ask me, so tell me, where are you from? And I'm often left confused. I'm an Indian, but I've actually lived in the UAE all my life. The UAE feels like it's my home. But then again, I have to renew my visa every couple of years, and there's a sense in which the UAE might not be my home. I think that, fe that is often the common feeling for most expats. But I think expat Christians especially have a special insight into thinking about how our Christian lives are much like the same. Christians, too, know what it's like to live in between two kingdoms the kingdom of earth, and the kingdom of heaven. They recognize that in the kingdom of earth, uh, before Christ saved them from their sins, they were living for this world. And quite honestly, they were enslaved to sin. Sin was their master. And they did not know of the condemnation of sin. But when God divinely intervened, revealing Jesus Christ and exposing to them their sinfulness, they came to saving faith when they put their faith and trust in what Christ did on the cross for them, to save them from their sin. We were people who've been set free from our sin in order now to freely live for King Jesus and for His kingdom. But we're not physically in that kingdom, are we? Although we are citizens of heaven, and Jesus is our king, we still live on this earth. And we're easily lured to live as if we are still a part of the kingdom of the earth. So what does it look like to live as people of the coming kingdom while we still live here on earth? That's what we're, that's what we're going to consider as we look at Colossians chapter 3. But before we begin, I wanted to give us some context, help us know where we're at. So um, the the book of Colossians uh, speaks about how this young gathering of believers were growing fervently in their faith and love for one another. And Paul wanted to see this church grow in even more maturity. So that this church was being known for making much of Jesus Christ, and yet it was also a church that had false teaching. 
It seems like these false teachers that were amongst them uh, were coming up with some kind of new philosophy, maybe some new better perspective from God on how they are to live. If you look to chapter 2, uh, you'd, you'd realize that either they were calling the church to this better way of living by going back to the law and the, re- the requirements of the law, or by insisting that they somehow have to live this ascetic life, this life of self-denial, uh, this life of, you know, don't handle, don't touch, don't do this and don't do that. That's what it's like to be a Christian. But if you read the whole book and you see the big repeated theme The most serious problem, according to Paul, was that this false teaching was turning the church's attention away from Jesus Christ and seeing him as far superior than anything and anyone. You know, while we live on earth, churches and Christians will always be tempted to turn their attention away from Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we see that in churches is through its teaching. Will the church continue to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified again and again and again? Or will they begin to think, it's it's a little too repetitive. People need something better. They need something different. That's an alarming sign. One of the ways Christians turn their attention away from Christ is by creating a further distance from the kind of person they are in public amongst other Christians versus the kind of person they are in private when no one's looking. These are dangerous things, which is why Paul wants the church to turn its attention to the new life that comes through Jesus Christ. Paul wants them to see that the life they received in Christ Jesus must have a transforming effect on their personal lives and their lives as a church. So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, We're going to consider from verses 1 to 4, the life in Christ. And then we'll consider from verses 5 to 11, what that means for our personal lives. And then finally, from verses 12 to 17, we'll consider what it means for us as Christians in the church. What lasting change can life in Christ provide God's redeemed people as we journey on earth, making our way towards heaven? Let's consider our first point life in Christ. Let me read from verses 1 to 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. What great verses, isn't it, to ponder if you're a Christian. Paul wants us to clearly see all the things that Christ has done in the past, what Christ does in the present, and what he will do in the future. Let's consider that. So through Christ, we have gone from being dead to being raised up in Christ. What sets the Christian apart from non-Christians is that they have life. No matter the kind of good life that non-Christians seemingly have, what they don't have is the life of Christ. And according to verse 3, you referring to Colossian Christians, were once a people who were dead. Paul is speaking of spiritual death. He's saying that those who have not received Life from Jesus Christ, salvation through Him, are actually dead. Dead to God. They are in opposition to Him. They reject Him, the giver of life and the creator of the world. And this opposition and rejection, this being spiritually dead to God, will result in judgment and eternal death. But verse 1 offers us hope, isn't it? Jesus offers up his life by dying in the place of the spiritually dead in order for them to escape God's judgment that's due to them. And like Christ raised from the dead, those who believed in Jesus will also have this life. Beloved brothers and sisters, I want you to consider the work that Christ has done for us. 
Well, that's what he did in the past. In the present, Christ now is seated at the right hand of God. This is to show that Jesus has been bestowed upon all authority and power and honor and glory. And every knee will bow down and confess that he is Lord. And so for those who put their faith and trust in Jesus, they have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their king. He is theirs, seated at the right hand. Not only is he seated at the right hand of God right now, at the present, our life, those who have been redeemed by Jesus, our life is hidden with Christ in God. Look, that doesn't mean that we're somehow hidden from pain and suffering, but at one level what that means is that we've been hidden from the wrath of God and the judgment that is due upon us. Christ bears it. And yet in another sense, Christ, with Christ as our Lord, we find comfort in Him. We find our security in Him. And we know that we can trust Him. And so where the world might despise us, Christ welcomes us and calls us His own. But Paul also wants us to know what will happen in the future. Christ will return. The fact that Christ has risen from the, gra- from the grave and is up seated at the right hand is evidence that He is alive and that He is coming to judge the living and the dead. And only those who have received Him as their King will be taken to be with Him in glory forever in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, these promises are only for Christians and are meant to give us hope for the present. Anything else that we might hope for in the present will not take us into glory and into presence with God our Father. If you're not a Christian, and maybe you're you're not a Christian and you're content with not being a Christian, I want you to know that your opposition to God does not go unnoticed. And that if you do not repent now, you will not appear with Jesus into His glory and into heaven. In fact, like verse 6 will point us to, a far greater wrath is awaiting you. What would it take for you to repent and believe in Jesus Christ and receive that life now? My fellow brothers and sisters, the things that Paul lists out about Christ aren't things that we're meant to think about when we feel like it. Actually, consider what Paul says. Those two repeated phrases, seek the things that are above, set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on the earth. These are meant to be things that we continuously do. Christians are meant to seek new things, and not just seek it, they're to set their mind on heavenly things. That's a bit of a directional change, isn't it? For those of us who've been given new life, we cannot live like we used to. In other words, Paul is saying that this gospel that saves must not only affect our hearts, giving us new life, but our minds and our actions. According to the section, we need to actively think about the work of Christ so that it can have an active effect in our day-to-day lives. So let me ask you, what do you find your mind often thinking about? What is it that consumes your attention? Maybe if you have come to the UAE with a particular pursuit for money, maybe a particular pursuit of a certain kind of job, I wonder how much of that is what you think about in your mind. Look, I don't think Paul is telling us that we need to leave our jobs to get rid of our lives and maybe find ourselves in some mountain far away from the rest of the world. Neither do I think that Paul is saying that we cannot enjoy some of the blessings that are found in this world. Blessings like good friendship and times together as family. Maybe even good food or vacation, times of rest. No, Paul is instructing the church and us to assess what we seek and to set our minds on as a way to see if we are truly living in light of the new life we've received in Christ. That which we set our mind to is what we will pursue. 
We've been saved from our sin, and we now have a new master, a good master and king. Will you set your mind to seek after him? What does that look like? What does it look like to set our minds on the things that are above? Well, let's consider how our life in Christ affects our personal lives. We'll look at that from verses 5 to 11. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. In this section, Paul is directing the Colossians to consider life on earth as a war. And now it's not the kind of battle that the rest of the world is waging, but notice it is the battle of our souls. And in this battle, prisoners are not just meant to be taken up as captives. They are to be killed. These prisoners are not people, but they are earthly things. Things that take our attention away from Christ. To help us understand what exactly we are to put to death, Paul gives us what I think are two lists. One list that addresses our passions and lusts, and another list that gets at our mouths. Let's consider those two lists separately. Look at verse 5 here. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. It's plain, isn't it? We are to have nothing to do with sexual sin. Whether it is sex before marriage, infidelity with, while in marriage, nor pornography or anything close to it. Unlike the world trying to redefine sexuality according to its terms and boundaries, Christians take their direction from God and put it to death. But I wonder, have you found yourself discounting sexual sin? As if it's not something you either struggle with or that you could possibly struggle with. Are you currently consuming yourself in pornography with no desire to give it up? Maybe it's not pornography. Do you find yourself being consumed by particular shows or books or activities or conversation topics with your colleagues or friends that aren't necessarily pornographic, but have little hints, hints of it, and you kind of like it? While we are in, the, in this world, there will always be more ways to discount something that God sees as sin by saying that it's just not that bad. Just as much as sexual sin is to be put to death, so are our earthly desires. Particularly, I think he's addressing greed and covetousness. You see, if a Christian cannot be content with what God has given them, and if they find in themselves this constant wanting for more, Paul is suggesting that we are actually in the business of manufacturing idols. It is as if we're saying to God, look, I'd like to share you with my idol, because you just don't match my expectation. You just don't make the cut, God. But God will not share our worship with another. We must make a choice. Look, if there's something you desperately want from God, and so far He has not given it to you, and you're starting to doubt His goodness, maybe to the point of anger. My friend, I think that's a sign that you've turned your affections away from Jesus Christ and towards that particular idol. But lest we somehow think we are better off than the list that is here, Paul gives us what I think is a more piercing list. Paul wants us to consider our mouths and the things that come out of our mouths. Look at verses 8 and 9. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Verse 9, he talks about lying to one another. Think about the list that's here. Did you see what Paul is doing? 
He is leaving no room for people to say that they do not have a problem with sin. I mean, just look at the start of the list and the, and the end of it, anger and lying. Nobody can say that they've never been angry or that they do not lie. And if they say they, they do not lie, they probably are lying that they do not lie. You remember early in my sermon, I said that one of the ways we know we're drifting away from our affection towards Jesus is by creating a uh, separation between our public life and our private life. You can say that the things in this list are likely the things that often happen in private for many of us. But over time, will surface itself up in public. You know, we've all come through a pandemic where we've increasingly lived our lives pretty privately. And so I must assume that the things said here apply to us. At some point, all of us have likely struggled with this. But I wondered if we've started to make a habit of giving into these sins. Over the course of the last year, have you found yourself becoming increasingly short-tempered? So often that it, it becomes so often that it seems like you're a constantly hot brewing pot of anger. And sort of the next little thing that that tips it over is all it takes for you to blow up. Has your anger reached its burning point that you are even willing to consider inflicting pain? Maybe not physical pain, but you've thought about it. Is your anger the kind of anger which seeks to produce wrathful control over people's lives? And when they don't do what you want, you're filled with rage. Or do you find yourself forming long lists of problems that you have with people? And it seems like, in your estimation, that list is far greater than you. And the problem really isn't you, really, right? The problem is them. I wonder whether you've started to build a long list to the point that in the inner recesses of your heart, you've begun to mistreat these people, assuming that you can never be at fault. What about in church? I wonder whether some of us come to church with a year for gossip and ill speech. Looking to find out what's the latest thing that's going wrong with people. And that seems to be engaging our minds more than the good news of Jesus. I wonder whether part of the reason why Paul highlights these particular sins is because some in Colossae were actually giving themselves over to these sins. Brothers and sisters, if we claim to be Christians, we must seek our Lord's help to unify our public and our private lives. For those of us who've been given a new identity, those of us who've received the life that we found in Christ, they long for it to affect their personal lives. We're to put these areas of sin to death. Or like an old smelly robe, we're to put it away for good. Paul directs our attention to these two lists and commands us to put it to death because something has happened in the life of the believer. You see, our justification, really our being declared right in God's eyes, and our future glorification, when we will one day be welcomed into heaven and be with Jesus and our God forever, must have its effect on our ongoing sanctification, this growing in holiness, becoming more in the likeness of Jesus Christ. We've been saved in order that we might grow to live holy lives. And there's a visible difference between a believer struggling with sin and a non-Christian willingly walking and living in sin, like verse 7. And to walk and live in sin is to deny that sin is a problem at all and that it is a visible evidence of our rebellion against God. To walk and live in sin is to deny that sin has any consequence at all, which Paul rightly reminds us in verse 6. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. When a Christian struggles with sin, they realize that while they're on earth, they're going to be tempted to live like this world. And until they are in heaven, they wage war against their sins. 
They're working by the Spirit's power to turn away from sin. They seek to show a growing track record of living in light of God's way and a declining track record of living for their desires. And so when a believer comes across a passage like like this, they're not trying to defend themselves or compare themselves with others just in order to make them feel good about themselves. No, they look at lists like this and they plead with their God to help them see what's going on in their heart and ask for God to enable them to put sin to death. You see, if someone claims to be a Christian and yet they are not making a practice of fighting sin, rather they're giving in and they're defeated by it, they might be beginning to prove that they're truly not living for Jesus. They might be living a lie. God's promised truth of judgment and wrath still will apply to them. And because they, ha- will have a, because they will have a proven track record of not having ever followed or lived for Jesus. So brothers and sisters, would you say that this kind of wartime living best describes the way you live right now? Do you recognize that you are at war? What are you doing to prepare for it? Verse 9 and 10 offer real hope for Christians seeking to let their personal life be shaped by the life of Christ. We find strength to daily put on the new self when we are renewed in the knowledge after the image of our Creator. In other words, the more we turn to God's Word, we learn how great and marvelous is our God, how unsearchable His ways are, how our sin has corrupted and lied to us, leads us to death and how powerful His salvation is through His Son's work, and what great a price has been paid for our freedom from sin, that we now live our lives keeping in step with the Spirit. And One day we will be with our God forever. No more to face the temptation of sin. No more to wrestle with it again, but to rest in our Savior's love forever. It's why in verse 11, Paul can rejoice in the power of the gospel, that it no longer divides people in terms of their nationalities or their social status, no longer makes one person more likely to make it to heaven than another. No, we Christians have a new theme for our lives. Christ is all and in all. Christ, my Savior, resides in those He redeems, and He is all that I need. This is good news for those who desire to be putting sin to death. This is good news for those of us who are currently convicted by our sin when we consider a passage like this. This is the kind of good news that frees us up to confess. To confess our sin to God. To confess our sin to one another. Because we, we desire for the Holy Spirit to shape and produce genuine repentance in our lives. The Christian life is not just about what we are to put off. There are things that we must put on. And what we are asked to put on affects how we deal with one another as Christians, Christians in the church. Let's consider our last section. How does the life we have in Christ affect our life as a church? Verses 12 to 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were indeed called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The previous list can be summarized as sins that promote selfishness and self-centeredness. 
But now look at all the things Paul points out in this section. One of the ways we are being sanctified as believers is by growing in selflessness, where we seek to put the well-being of others over ourselves. After all, isn't this what our Savior did? By condescending to earth, being born among sinners, only to subject himself to obeying the Father's plan that involved his death. Jesus Christ is our model for selflessness. What does it look like for Christians in the church to practice selflessness? I think from the list that we see here, we see selflessness being displayed in our unity and in our service. Let's look at what it means to have selfless unity. Look back again in verse 11, and and you will see how Paul speaks of the kind of unity that unites the kind of people who wouldn't normally unite with each other. So now, how are we to live as people united by Jesus? Well, consider verses 12 and 13. We are to be people who are filled with hearts of compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing up with one another. We set aside our complaints against one another. We seek to forgive. Aren't there enough applications already for us in there? These traits are things that don't come naturally to us, isn't it? It is natural to show compassion to the kinds of people we prefer. But it's very hard to show compassion and kindness to the people we normally do not want to be around. But that's the kind of compassion we are to emulate and give and show. Verse 13 might might suggest that there would likely have been some issue within the congregation that caused the members to complain and to be impatient with each other. But we practice unity by prayerfully growing in these traits described in verses 12 and 13. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know that there will never be a church on this side that will be immune to complaining impatient and frustrated hearts. But if we seek after Christ, we can see growth. Brothers and sisters, we have a role to play when we, when we gather together. Your role isn't just to sort of show up and as quickly as we offer the benediction, run away, but to use that as a means and time to get to know one another, maybe as a starting point to, to get to know people. One of the many reasons we commit to a church is so that we can actually help each other grow in these areas. Grow to putting sin to death and living for Jesus. Who are the kinds of people in this church that you are struggling to bear up with? Why are they people you more struggle to bear up with than certain others? I know this passage addresses church members. But we see a lot of this being played out in marriages for those of us who are married, right? Husbands and wives, uh, part of the reasons we complain and harbor resentment against each other is because we just don't like it when our way is not met. Often than not, we let particular expectations define how and when we should love our spouse. As if our marriages are something of an examination and we're scoring each other based on our efforts. But if our marriages are to be rooted in Christ's unending love for his bride, we see in him both our model and our source for forgiveness and love. And the same can be said of our relationships in the the church. If we're struggling to forgive, the answer isn't to just stay silent or to avoid people. No. We might need God's help. We might need God's help to speak honestly and truthfully of maybe particular concerns we've experienced. If you are there right now, if you're struggling to forgive somebody here or another Christian, can I encourage you to seek help to talk about it? Talk to the member that maybe brought you here. Talk to Frank and I, we're the two elders here today. We'd love to help you think about it but ask that the Lord would direct your hearts to Jesus and consider the forgiveness you've received in Him as a means of forgiving those whom whom have hurt you. 
If we're to be the kind of Christians that will confess our sin to one another, and, and if we're to live honest and open lives, I assure you that there are going to come times when we're just going to struggle to be compassionate and kind with each other. But if we're going to welcome others to confess their sin, we should be ready to compassionately point them to Jesus Christ as their Savior and not withdraw ourselves from them. Covenant and Hope Church, what would you say this church is known for? I hope we're known for many good things. But would you say that we are known for being selfless and humble in our unity? I'm not saying that we all have to agree with each other 100% of the time. We're going to have our differences, and that's okay. But what can we consider setting aside our differences to further the work of Christ in the life of our church and to promote unity? Consider maybe some in our church who might emulate this kind of selfless unity. Consider getting to know them. Ask them why they do what they do. The way to grow in these areas of selfless unity is by putting on love and the peace found in Christ. Just like Christ is our motivation for selflessness, He also enables us to pursue it. Have you considered how selfless His love is for us? His love was always selfless. It was so shocking that even the Pharisees got angry when He dined with sinners and tax collectors. Christ has made it possible for us to be at peace with God as opposed to being enemies to God. So as one Christian minister puts it, the rule of Christ is a rule of peace. And it's inconceivable that those who share with one another the benefits of that great peacemaking work of the cross should live with any hatred and contempt for each other in their hearts. The Christian congregation should be a realm of peace just because every Christian is totally committed to the rule of peace. When Christ rules in the heart, His peace will rule in the fellowship. Not only do we seek to pursue selfless unity, we also want to consider selfless service. As we look at our last two verses, Paul switches from character traits to some very practical areas of service. Uh, Oftentimes, uh, when I get to interview somebody who is seeking to join our church, uh, we work our way through that elder chat form, if you've been a part of that, and we talk about areas of service. Uh, Oftentimes, maybe if you remember that elder chat you've had, that elder would have told you that one of the best ways we serve each other is by pointing each other to God's Word. We get that from this verse. One of the ways we practice selfless service is by making the word of Christ dwell richly in our gathering with each other and in our corporate worship. Did you catch how many times we read God's word, we heard God's word, Frank prayed through God's word for us? When we come to church, our aim is not to necessarily find points of disagreement. Oh, they didn't do that. Oh, I wish they sang that song today. No, we set aside our preference so as to show our visible preference for the Word of God. The preaching and the teaching of God's Word should receive our utmost attention. In fact, can I encourage you to come with a heart eager to receive from God's Word when we come every Sunday? But we also make the Word of Christ well richly by our admonishing and encouraging of one another. We gather so that we can encourage each other in following and obeying God's word. And this is going to require the kind of relationships that set aside personal preferences. So for those of us that are members of Covenant Hope Church, and for the many of you that are meeting up with each other over the course of the week, how often are you turning to God's word to encourage each other and to admonish one another? How often is Christ's word and Christ's gospel spoken about in your time together? We admonish one another, but we also sing to one another. Do you notice that? One of the ways we let God's word dwell richly is in our singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. 
When we sing, we aren't just filling up space in our service. When we sing, we aren't just doing it so that we can get our little private me and God time. When we sing, we sing with our whole heart and, and our minds firmly fixed on the words that we sing so that we might be freshly reminded of the gospel and the work of God. And then we sing to each other. We sing to remind each other that it is going to be these truths that are going to impact our lives for this week till Christ returns. Let me encourage you to sing. Sing the words of Christ. Sing aloud. Sing so that we make much of Christ and His Word dwell richly in our congregation. Finally, we practice selfless service in all that we say and do. Do you notice how we've sort of come full circle here? In the first part of the chapter, Paul points out areas of sin that involve our actions and our mouth. And now again, he speaks of our mouth and our actions. And this time, we are to use them to do good for one another. So brothers and sisters, we work hard to care for each other in this church. When we leave and when we go over the course of our week in our workplaces, we work hard so as to make much of Jesus Christ. We work unto our master, working diligently. We realize how God has transformed our hearts and our minds and even our words. So we, pee, so we speak as people of grace, speaking words of grace, speaking so that we can make much of Jesus Christ. In all that we say and do, we get to declare that sin and this world and our desires no longer direct our lives. We give it all up to serve our God and to serve one another. We find ourselves united and happily serving one another. When we find ourselves united and happily serving one another, we realize this is all God's doing, God's work. God at work in our lives, God at work in the life of his people. And so we are thankful, thankful to our God, because he who has begun a good work is faithful to bring it to completion. This is what it means then to live in light of the life that Christ has won for us. This is what it means to live as people here on earth, eagerly waiting for our Lord's return. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we recognize that apart from your Spirit's work in our lives, we could do none of the things that are here. Father, apart from your Spirit's work, we will find no reason, no joy, to seek the things that are above. And yet, Father, we ask that you would help us now, those of us who are Christians, to consider the life that we have received in Christ. Consider it daily. Make it our aim to pursue Jesus Christ in all of our lives, both in private and in public. Father, we pray that you would do that so that you would receive the glory. We pray this for your name's sake. Amen.